My bandmates in Bentney have a lot of experience as professional musicians, but we all know we have a long way to go in our musical quest and we have a lot to learn. So rather than just having me or one of them do a Q&A, I thought it'd be cool to get all six of us together in a room to answer your questions. So thank you for submitting all those questions. I think you'll enjoy. There's a variety of answers, a lot of different perspectives here. And we're all going on tour together uh, this summer, all summer, all over the U.S. So it would be great to meet you in person and maybe answer some more questions questions in person if you come to our shows. Hugh writes, were you ever in bands slash groups that didn't click and affected your performance? And how did you overcome that? First of all, Gavin's a big problem. (laughs) (laughs) Is that a fat joke? Before Bentney was these six people who've been together for a long time, we had a bunch of people who came and went and, and weren't exactly perfect fits. And I think it's just necessary to be in a band that doesn't click and keep trying to really define the reasons, figure out exactly what's missing, but also what's actually working in the band. And perhaps the key thing to do is to try to uh, play to the band's strengths a little more, see what you actually are good at, and try to write music for that until things start to make sense a little bit more interpersonally. I once was in an R&B band when I was 15, and everyone else was in their 60s. And, um, I left that band, I pretty much ghosted them. Don't do that, that's a bad thing to do. Now some of those people are dead. (laughs) Not because of me. Andreas Canari writes, Being a music university student myself, I find it hard to commit to a band project because I feel like there are so many more things I want to learn before I start making my own music. But I also feel like I'd be wasting time the more time I let go by. How did you manage it yourself, and what is your advice? I have three three things. One, I feel like if you are going to music school, you're going there because you want to do music. So you shouldn't let the school get in the way of you doing music. Two, uh, I think we've met a lot of people that like have a hard time forming new bands after school because when you're out of school, you have other shit to do. So like, why not? Why not now? And three, uh, if you're coming at it with the approach that you think that it might be a waste of time, it's possible that it will be a waste of time, but only because you think it might be. So if you're going to do it, you should do it all the way. Otherwise, it's not going to be worth it. Frankie writes, what advice would you give to a music major that's just starting out? When I first got to college, I had been playing guitar for years, and I just stopped because everyone was so much better than me. Uh, And it's such a foolish thing, like in hindsight, looking back on that time when, especially when you're young, you're 18, 19 years old, and you're really kind of finding your own and a little insecure about yourself, it's really important to remember that everyone starts out bad at things. And if you're not good at something yet, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be. So don't be afraid to continue to do things even if you're not good at them. DeMarco Type Beats writes, What are some of the new techniques, ideas, theories, and technologies that you believe will have the biggest impact on music? I think the VR thing will take off eventually, and, and when it does, I think probably music production will go very headphone-based and start to go in a kind of binaural direction. 2 Don Cab 2 for you writes, Hi, hope y'all are having a good day. My question is directed at any member of the band that dabbles in more than one kind of art. Do you think comparisons between music and other mediums like sculpting and painting are fair? I think that comparing to art forms is totally fair. I think music improv and comedy improv have a lot in common and like doing the other makes you better at the first one. Jared Might writes, How can I tell if my bass playing is too busy? If you omit your part and it doesn't seem to have made the song any worse, then it definitely wasn't worth having in. And if you omit your part and then suddenly the song sounds a little more empty or it doesn't pack the punch it had before, maybe your part wasn't too busy. You know, a lot of people come up listening to like Les Claypool or Flea or Jaco or, you know, I feel like they were more the exception than the rule. You know, look at Paul McCartney. That bitch didn't do much. The the biggest mistake I see bass players making in their part selection is neglecting their responsibility to the low end, where they are 
like that you have to understand if if you're want to do a fill all of a sudden all of a sudden the low end is going to drop out of the song and if it's a spot in the song where that's okay to happen then great but a lot of the times it's not if you could rest anyway that's where a fill could go was the time you need to just be a be a be a rock for everyone to crash upon noah murphy writes where do you draw the line between creative influence and ripping off someone else's work? I sometimes worry that the music I write is too much like the music I listen to, or that if I use a chord progression slash composition technique I learned from somebody else, that it's not as genuine to myself as it could be. Thank you. Love your music and your channel. You could try and write something exactly like whoever your hero is, be it Frank Zappa or anyone. But because you are you and you are not them, it will ultimately be different. And you know, sure, yeah, the things that you write at first may sound, you know, a lot like carbon copies of your heroes, but who you are as an instrumentalist and as a writer will eventually shine through. Read the book Steal Like an Artist. It gives you lots of tips how to steal the right way. Every artist is a thief, but make sure that you're stealing a diamond and not just a piece of glass. This bird is baked, writes. Are lyrics always a priority when writing a piece, or do they sometimes have to take a back seat? Do you ever find yourself forming the rest of the song to fit the lyrics so that you can tell a better story? Music makes you feel feelings. Words make you think thoughts. Songs make you feel thoughts, is the quote I often think about when I'm addressing this question for myself. And so, it's not that one takes priority over another as much as they have this consistent little dance to make you feel thoughts. Shy Guy Infinity writes, What do you think about humans becoming obsolete in performance and composition as technology takes our place? I, for one, am in a state of existential dread. That's not going to happen in, in, in art. Um, is that, I think it kind of misses the point of what art is, where it's fundamentally a way that humans communicate with each other. Like, it's just basically a way of, of expressing yourself that you can't do with words um, or you know in a typical way like I am right now like a computer is never going to be able to express your personal feelings better than you can we're going to be using them more and more in the creation of art and their presence is going to drastically change kind of the the way art is but as far as just a computer making art by itself, I don't think it'll happen. Unless, well, unless they become, you know, fully conscious, basically. And then that's a whole other can of worms. AI is making music right now mm -hmm. that's firmly based on music that humans have already created. Right. Like a Bach invention or something like that. But I wonder when they get to this point where uh, I use they, <laughs> uh, where AI is making art that does not have a human reference point, I wonder if it would even be worthwhile or comprehensible to us. I don't think we would be able to recognize it because the only way we can understand music is the way that we can com like contextualize it. So there's, you know, for us there's no music without the music that we already know. So no matter how out of the box or, you know, like unmusical the AI is like, well, the only way we can understand it as music is by justifying it as something that we already understand. Right. I, al I also think that it's possible that AI can make art that's, that's even more meaningful to humans than human art, possibly. Recognizing something in a piece of art that maybe is not the intent of the artist, but but you know your own reaction upon seeing something is, I think, another in inherently human thing, and that can come from you know artistic stimuli that has not been made by a person. But it's like it's not a question of like it's humans are still going to be making art because like it's it's a cre it's it's just the communication part. It's like it's like the idea of like you know maybe you could have a really interesting conversation with a computer eventually. But you're still gonna need to talk to humans too. And with regards to the existential dread you expressed, I think it's reasonable to expect that everything that is now won't be later in some way. Because one of the only constants in history seems to be change. So rather than dreading your event the eventual disappearance of everything you love, um, 
just think of it maybe more as just part of the way things go and then it's not as hard to you know to imagine uh, within my own life I have a lot of ex existential dread especially right now is you know you just sort of watching yourself get older and then you you know you're seeing your parents get older I'm gonna be 30 soon which isn't like a huge deal but it just seems like fundamentally we're always going to be facing this changing tide out with the old and with the new kind of thing and you know we're gonna die baby Lorenzo Leopardi writes where do you draw the line between art and entertainment where do you draw the line between art and entertainment <laughs> Does there need to be a line? Ooh! Oh. Those two are not on separate poles. It's not black and white. It's either entertainment or art. Uh, I, I would venture to say that almost all the art I like is entertaining. There's a small portion that's not, uh, but I enjoy it for other reasons. I think art is supposed to be a conversation of some sort between the artist and the audience. Sometimes the art isn't doesn't feel like entertainment because its mission in the conversation is to provoke something besides joy or fun or excitement. I would say for myself there's a there is a line and I think it's a subjective one. I think it's like what is art and entertainment differs for every person but I think the fundamental difference is that art you walk away from art having learned something about the world that you live in um, are just the, you know, the experience of being a person. Like, you know, you, you can get a tremendous amount of, or at least I can get a tremendous amount of entertainment from w either reading a great novel or watching a great football game. But the reason I don't consider the football game art is because, you know, at the, when you walk away from the football game, and you're never going to really have a different perspective on the world.